set up here real fast. They gave me some awesome speed walking music to get up on stage. So I am the last speaker to go before lunch. How many of you are excited about that? Anyone? All right. So as, as he said, I'm going to be talking about sensory-friendly monitoring. And the reason I started building this talk was actually because I was working before my current job at a startup. I was working at a startup. Yeah. <laughs> the joke I started making all the time was that startups run lean, right? So you get yourself into this situation where maybe you feel underpowered, and then you get into the trap. And the trap is, I need to know things so that I can make sure nothing ever breaks because I have no redundancy on my team, so I'm waking up at 4 o'clock in the morning and that's unpleasant. So then we start to get into this situation where I just need to make my status page and I just need to integrate Trello and Slack, major duty, sorry, major duty. <laughs> right? This keeps going all the things, and then you just can't keep track of any one thing, especially when you see the lunch train pop out there, because then someone probably needs to notice, like, you know what would be great? We have this chat app, and we can do HR things with it, and make notifications, and we make plans for people that are positive, which is great, but then it gets mixed in the muck with everybody who's in there for operations, trying to just stay sane. So, what ends up happening for me and for my coworkers and other people I've worked with is you start to try and bury the noise. You're like, okay, how much of Slack do I really need appearing on my screen right now? Can we even develop a milder version of Slack, right? And so on the one side, you get to miss out on the at here, at channel all the time. You also miss out on anything you've integrated from, say, AWS or Google Compute that says, hey, you have an instance down. And what ends up happening then is that your team starts to miss whole notification services because they're not getting any of the receiving information, which means you then have to rely on the most unreliable form of notification ever, human notifications. How many customers can use your site before someone decides to tell you there's an outage? <laughs> so then you say, all right, I'm going to turn off some of these notifications but now I'm paranoid. <laughs> I am used to noise. I am now adapted to noise. And now it's quiet and I'm going to have a panic attack. So, this is not a healthy state to be in either. And in order to try and find a better balancing act, let's first talk a little bit about what can happen if you have excessive noise. Like that. So when you have a receiving end of alert, you'll notice that you're very skilled in the front there, your brain just starts to feel overwhelmed because your brain is wired to start processing everything in your environment. There are lots of things that we actually learn by osmosis. These are just things, chatter, back in the day, radio, maybe less so now, but people watching YouTube or doing whatever they're doing in our environment, and we're hearing all of that. So you think you're not paying attention to the muck, and you think that you're only on one task, but in reality, your brain is doing what it evolutionarily has adapted to do, and stuck in your environment. So what actually ends up starting to happen is you start to reduce the quality of your work. You start to reduce the work output, your, you know, how quickly you're able to put things out. And it actually happens very quickly. So lots of studies have been done about what happens when you receive a short interruption on a long task. So for example, maybe you're at the startup and you're like, I need to do something for Kubernetes. We'll get on them. I need to deploy a new microservice or whatever. And I'm planning it out and then Joe Walkup appears. I can't answer my email. Are you connected to the internet? Right. And then goes, there goes your lock up. So I've just been distracted, right, from this longer term task. 
And you would think, oh no, you're just you can just recenter and attack. But on average, studies have shown it's anywhere between 20 and 25 minutes to refocus on a complicated task that you've been interrupted on, even just for up to three seconds. A three-second interruption can cause up to 25 minutes of delay for your brain to recover. Ouch. And then there's something to be said about <laughs> decreasing quality. So this comes with another study that was actually done for the Reese Irving, where they were actually tracking people who were doing AP tests. And they were curious what would happen. You have 20 minutes to write out your essay. We're going to give you a quick interruption. We're just going to let you keep on going. And they found that people's scores dropped. Right? That probably doesn't surprise too much. What might surprise is they thought to themselves, well, research says I should give them their 20 minutes back. And so they did. The scores did not rebound. So it's not just a matter of adding back in the extra time from the interruption because you are not actually in the same state you were in when you were interrupted. And then there's multitasking. Last study, I promise. So we have multitasking, and this was another study that was done where they actually took 300 participants and said, do this ridiculously obscenely repetitive task. Click this button, do, 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 and we're going to start interviewing. I'm sorry, interrupting you while you're doing this task. And they found that actually, during the interruptions, and again, at this point, probably no surprise, they couldn't repeat the task. And we're not talking, you know, a really complicated task like I need to deploy a microservice. We're talking a really simple task of order the following three things repetitively. And they stopped being able to do it. As part of this, they actually show that people's frustration as the urgency or as the frequency of these, again, short interruptions kept reappearing, everything went up, right? So if you think about yourself in a stressed, anxious, frustrated, angry, whatever state, that's also going to put pressure on all the other areas of work. So this is the tone of information about why you really want to try to avoid falling into the trap of slide one, which is I need to know everything to stay sane so nothing ever breaks, when you're actually probably driving yourself insane by trying to know everything and not actually receiving the information that you need to receive. So what do we do? First, you need to be more aware of what's coming in. Now, depending on where you're working, startup, big corporate, whatever, it doesn't matter, you should have a fair sense of what your sources of noise are. If you're working with AWS, you're probably going to have to have alerts coming through there. If you're working with Google Compute from there, if you have a web app and you have you know, your web app monitoring system of choice, you're going to get you know, alerts from there. And then, of course, there are chatty people because we all know we don't exclusively use Slack to integrate bots. Although, I don't know, maybe you do. <laughs> so beyond that, you actually need to start categorizing. And this is to try and get a better handle on what's coming into your world, right? So now you need to know the source, you need to know what type. Is it urgent? Is it really not so urgent? And start to prioritize. And this is so you can build a workflow around it. For example, if you have a minor outage lasted a second or less on your site and it just self-healed itself, you maybe don't even need a notification, maybe just a message, because at that point it self-healed to correct itself, your intervention is not required. However, if you have a massive outage that's not healing, that's persisting, that requires your manual intervention, you want it to have increasing levels of noisiness to get the appropriate team's attention. And that's how you're going to start creating a routine to clear out your clutter, right? So over time, things diverge. You might find that alerts are going off that are no longer useful to you. Don't keep them. We're a bit like hoarders in that way, right? We're like, oh, I set this up once and it might be useful later, so I'm going to keep it forever. And it's digital, so it's not taking up space, exactly. But it's taking up space in your brain. So as an example, here are some sources of noise to be aware of. You might have a logging system set up, right? And you can see this chaos graph that I made for you lovely people with some choice logos of no particular 
relevance to anyone, but right? So you have everybody's spamming each other, right? Because you might have email notifications set up to integrate into your Jira tickets, but oh wait, someone's blocked and that's going through to Slack and someone made a PR request on GitHub. You get the point. So you go through and you're like, all right, who are my sources of my noise and what do I really need to know? Do I really need to know someone updates that Jira ticket or do I just need to know if it's closed, maybe? And how much of that is integrated into chat? Because people leave chat open a lot these days, so you probably want to tone that noise down as much as possible so that the higher priority items can come through a little clearer. And then there's yourself. What do I mean by you? Well, hint. <laughs> Right? How many of you are attending this talk and no judgment, checking, email, slacks, etc.? Yes, all of you are almost good. <laughs> so, when you're distracting, it's not just PagerDuty, Victorops, AWS, GCP, etc., that are clamoring for your attention. Your own stuff is clamoring for your attention. By the way, these are all not real. All these alerts, I just generated them, but just you get the point, right? You get social media alerts, you get email alerts, you get messages on your phone, and everyone's trying to clamor for your attention. This is just your social sphere. So again, Kubernetes example, microservice, maybe you don't get a page alert that something's down, but you get a message from your mom. It could be equally distracting depending on a lot of factors that I'm not gonna get into. <laughs> So what this means, it's important for everyone to establish boundaries. You need to know the boundaries of communication. And this is not just for inter-work communication, it's also for interpersonal, home, social communication. So you need to know when you can focus on your work because this is what's really going to give you, your team, your best chance of success and your ability to deploy projects and get things done and really be efficient. So, when you're communicating, you need to know what critical time period means for you. If you know you need an hour, you know you need two hours, take them, but let people know. Please don't interrupt me for the next two hours because I really need to focus unless something's on fire. And that simple communication can be more than enough for someone else to be like, okay, well, maybe I'll just go work it up somebody else, right? Joe, you're welcome. Um, you also want to, in a way, communicate this to friends and family. Now, when you're in work, you can say things like, don't interrupt me for two hours to the person sitting right over here. But when you're communicating at home, you might say, please don't interrupt me during the work day, unless there's a fire. Again, because they're, since they're not directly into your environment, you can't really, if your two-hour window is shifting around, you're just going to be spamming them if you're, you're changing schedule. Um, there, you're going to be notification fatiguing them, right? So you need to make sure you set boundaries. You also need to be somewhat clear on what high priority means. I mean, I just kind of blazed over it and said, don't talk to me unless it's on fire. But what fire means can drop <laughs> very drastically between people, departments, initiatives. So just be clear, you know, if any of the following happen, but nothing else. Right, but you also have to be able to have reasonable expectations. If you decide to implement this, you're like, this is great, yay, I'm gonna go back to work on Thursday, and it's gonna be awesome. Do not expect all of your coworkers to snap into line and be like, yes, I can remember this new thing that just appeared. Because they aren't here and enjoying this pre lunch talk with you, they don't necessarily have a reason, and they have their own stuff going on. So just be reasonable. If someone interrupts, you know, make sure that you're mindful and say, oh, well, thank you for asking me. Next time, please do this and just gently encourage them to go in the correct direction. Now, flipping back, I did go into a bunch of social noise, but we also have this stuff. All right. You need to make sure, going back to what I said before about categorizing, you need to be pretty granular too. I mean, after you do the alert sources and everything like that, you actually need to keep track of how alert, or I'm sorry, how accurate your alerts are. So you have a false positive. If you have a lot of them, something's not configured correctly somehow. You either have the threshold incorrectly or maybe what you thought you were alerting on, you are not. Same with false negatives. If you find something is alerting all the time and is just clearly fragile, you probably should look into fixing it, scheduling time to fix it, because as much as we never have time for anything, especially in startups, um, what you definitely don't have time for is if you and your team suffer burnout and can't push anything because legacy fragile system, 
You just can't call that stuff. Right, so you need to make sure that you're being proactive as well. If you're replacing a legacy system with a new system, make sure that you're migrating everything into the new system. This includes the alerts and what your metrics and criteria are. And this goes back to what I said before about clutter. Your requirements changed. Don't keep the stuff for the legacy system or it will keep bothering you even once it's defunct and deactivated. Once you start figuring out your frequency and your fragility and eliminating as much as possible the false and po the false things and positives, you're going to need to create your workflow. And this makes sure that you're targeting your noise. So for example, you do not want, I'm just going to keep picking on AWS because they're big, um, you do not want a cloud launch alert to pop into a general, that channel, I pride random hash is down. And then all the HR, sales, et cetera, people that are like, or, oh my God, something's down, because they don't know what that means. It says the word prod in it, it has a bunch of scary looking letters and numbers, you know, and, and it, they didn't need that. It's not their prerogative. What you need to do is either have an operations channel, DevOps, developers, front end, back end, and silo it out a little bit, so that at least in terms of the notifications, everything's piping where it needs to go. And it's also doing it, again, with the correct level of urgency. So at channel, prod one is down, if prod one is an ELB and controlling all of your traffic, you might want to send that to a page instead. If prod one is one EC2 instance in the Kubernetes cluster that's restarting itself, you might not want to even actually on that. It's just a little message that you can check in on later to know that something happened. So, you know, so make sure that when people you identify who needs to know who works on your infrastructure, front end, back end, to know once you've categorized your nice noise that it's going right where it needs to go pretty directly without distracting everybody else or confusing or panicking depending on, you know, the personality. Speaking of Slack, how many of you were in Slack on Wednesday, 27? <laughs> I'm going to say your hands are down, but I mean, we're all engineers, you were probably in Slack. So one of the things that happened that we noticed in particular, um, so the company I work for actually was based in Tel Aviv. So we have an East Coast team and a Tel Aviv team. So they're up seven hours before we are. So middle of their work day, beginning of our work day, Slack had a massive three hour outage. Now, for us, we were okay because we have pretty solid alerting. I mean, we're a logging company. So I really hope that I really hope that I can say that we have really solid alerting, and I can. Um, but it reminded me of when I worked at Companies Past, what would I have done at Company X if this had happened there? Because not all alert systems are as redundant. So now I just went through all these things to explain to you about printing it down and printing it down and printing it down. And now I'm going to tell you how yet, but. But, so let's say, how many teams do you have alerts running through Slack in some capacity? Yeah, okay. If Slack went down for three hours, which it did, <laughs> <laughs> or IRC, there you go. If Slack went down for three hours, if you have Slack as your only, for some reason, alert endpoint, everything dies. And if you are not flexible enough to either have those alerts going somewhere else or to switch to another endpoint. Email, at this point, it doesn't matter. You just want to make sure that you don't have an outage when you're, you know, you're using a service that is having an outage. So while I'm going through and saying, please be very mindful about not generating noise, please also be mindful about having a redundancy plan in case one of your major alert mechanisms, and it doesn't have to be Slack. I picked that on because it was fairly recent. But you know, lots of services and outages and if you're relying on that sort of service to give you critical information, you need to make sure you know what to do if for some reason that service is down and out for the count. And this goes back to Squidward in the beginning. So let's say you do not have redundancy both in so that you can switch channels from Slack or whatever. What happens when you hear quiet? You're still in the anxious state. Quiet is too quiet and you're freaking out about it because you don't trust the system to inform you of the problem. So you need to make sure that you know how reliable your tools are. Now I'm picking on Slack a lot again because it was recent, but for my experience, they've been mostly reliable. I've not, I can't say I have 
a long list of complaints against them, at least in terms of outages, right? But let's say a different service I'm using is prone to outages. I need to make sure I take steps in my infrastructure to account for that. If Slack suddenly became unreliable, I need to take steps in my infrastructure to account for that. And that means I'm only making as much duplication as I absolutely have to. So this is part of the printing down. I don't want to say, oh no, any service could go down at any time, so I have to make everything super redundant. And that is not what I'm saying. I'm saying you need to evaluate your services and duplicate the ones that might be a little flighty. Maybe even switch them out from them to someone else. Maybe it's up to you, it's your infrastructure, but you need to be considering this to make those calls. In terms of keeping things clean, you'll want to regularly review the alerts. And I've touched on this a few times now because it's so important to not have things alerting that are no longer helpful or useful. And I'll give an example of this. At one point, I was working at a generic startup. I'll call it Wild Wild West Systems. So 3WS had an RDS instance hanging out in the background. And what ended up happening was one of the developers was like, I really need to know if all the microservices are connected to my RDS instance. So he did some quick math, and he's like, hypothetically, if everything's connected correctly, it should be using this many megabytes of memory. And so suddenly it would appear that if that instance had less than that amount of memory in use, pager to me. <laughs> he made it a high priority alert. <laughs> And as the infrastructure at Wild Wild West Systems, that meant I got a random phone call at 3 a.m. This is true, by the way. I got a random phone call at 3 a.m. because the RDS instance was using a fraction of a percent less memory than was hypothetically ideal. <laughs> and I said, I'm going to mute that because I don't actually see any evidence of an outage in my box. So I went to him the next day and I said, hey, Bro. <laughs> what's up with the, what's up with that RDS instance? Everything okay? He said, well, well, I need to know if there's an outage in the microservices, and this made sense to me. I said, okay. But we also have logs, and so what might make more sense is if we alert on something in the logs, like a database failed connection, because there are other reasons that memory users should drop, especially in the middle of the night, when you're having a small company that's mostly local. Not many people are doing business in the middle of the night local time. So it makes sense that even the microservices themselves are just sending little key lives. They're not actually doing anything. So the fact that it dropped well below, or even a little bit below in the middle of the night probably isn't too surprising, and it just you know, woke me up and I was like, well, this is my life right now. Um, so we changed it, right? So we reviewed, we had a conversation, we assessed intent, we removed the unnecessary noise and replaced it with something that was more robust and would only alert if there was a problem in the environment, which was a failed database connect for any of the microservices in question. And this should happen for pretty much every alert trigger. Every time you get an alert, you need to actually evaluate that alert. Because if I had just let that slide, I mean, I don't know how flaky or not that alert would have been, but I think the fact that it appeared so quickly, I probably could have built in frustration over time if I did not address it reasonably fast. Um, so I needed to know the intention behind it so that we could make a better, more practical solution. If the incident is resolved, and in this case it was resolved by changing alert types, but let's say that you're alerting on something that maybe is a feature you're fixing, which means that once it's fixed or once a new feature is released, it's gone and dead, wipe it out, right? If the incident is resolved, resolved permanently, you don't need any trace of that bothering you or clogging the space. If it's an automated solution, you probably want to alert more towards the automation behavior than the actual problem because it's going to self-heal. And if the self-healing fails, that's when you care. Um, again, if the solution is permanent, and then if it's urgent. So, for example, with this RDS, now legitimately, if you know microservice had been down and they have didn't work, I probably should have gotten a page. So, I guess in that way, it would have been a high priority alert. But you don't want to be misassigning alerts like, "Hey, this button doesn't work, but I have a workaround 
be waking somebody up either, so just be really mindful. You don't want to be waking up your teammates. If it were you, would you want them to wake you up? And probably not, right? So this is this is how you're going to be keeping track of helping you stay sane, working with your coworkers so that they stay sane and they're not, oh man, that Quinn girl is always making alerts everywhere. Maybe we'll just restrict her privileges and the infrastructure so she can't do that anymore and then we'll cloud watch for you. You know, you don't want to be that person. Um, I posted some additional meeting, which is some of this are actually the studies that I was quoting before. Um, so if you people who like to take additional reading snapshots, this is, I don't know how to count either. I'm up here, one, two, three. So the idea is, the top three are things that I was quoting before about the repetitive study, about the 20 to 25 minutes, and about the AP exams. And so if you wanted to actually read a little bit more fully what that was all about, definitely head up on all that. <coughs> and I'm a contestant, so I'll grab it while I And if you have any questions, please come help me down.